Did you know that many universities and staff have deep connections to the Chinese Communist Party and that they are transferring research data and intellectual properties to China? According to a report by the Globe and Mail, university professors and researchers have set up joint ventures with Chinese companies to commercialize Canadian research results. Due to the potential dangers, the Alberta government ordered four of its major universities to suspend partnerships with individuals or organizations with ties to the Chinese Communist Party, citing threats to Canadian national security and the possibility that related research could be used to promote human rights abuses by the Communist regime. I am deeply concerned about the potential theft of Canadian intellectual property and further concerned that research partnerships with the People's Republic of China may be used by Chinese military and intelligence agencies, reads a statement from Alberta's Advanced Education Minister, Demetrius Nicolaitis. According to the report, one of the province's top institutions, the University of Alberta, was found to have a long and deep relationship with China, with several staff and researchers having formed joint ventures with funding from Chinese state-run enterprises to commercialize Canadian research in China. The Globe and Mail reported in May that despite previous federal warnings about the national security risks of working with China, the U of A has maintained close research collaborations with China including sharing and transferring research in strategically important areas such as nanotechnology, biotechnology and artificial intelligence. My priority is to work with our post-secondary institutions to protect Canadians' intellectual property and to ensure that Alberta institutions do not enter into agreements with entities that would undermine our country's core national interests, said Nicolaitis. In his statement, Nicolaitis also stressed the province would welcome a comprehensive national framework from Ottawa on these serious pressing issues. The universities named in the government's order are the University of Alberta, the University of Calgary, the University of Lethbridge and Athabasca University. The institutions have 90 days to review their cooperation with China and submit a report to the province detailing all agreements research relationships, institutional relationships and joint ventures with entities that have ties to the CCP. The U of A and the U of C responded to the Globe on May 23rd that they were working on an email from the Chancellor and would not comment immediately. The other two universities have not responded to requests for comment. The Globe's Ottawa Bureau Chief Robert Fife said in a comment for the last 20 years, universities were encouraged to collaborate and accept funding from Chinese entities. Universities largely turned a blind eye to the rise of an aggressive China under the one-man rule of President Xi Jinping. Brutal repression of Muslim Uyghurs and the harsh crackdown in Hong Kong were ignored. Nor was much attention paid to China vacuuming up Canadian intellectual property and scientific data. When questioned by The Globe, the University of Alberta declined to discuss its research activities with China other than to state, we have received no directives related to China from the federal government. This is clearly no longer acceptable, but it requires strong leadership from Ottawa to set down criteria for collaboration with China and fields of scientific study that should be protected. We await a federal report on this issue on June 25th to see if the federal government will finally act, said Fife. In March, Innovation, Science and Economic Development, Canada issued a policy statement warning the Canadian research community of the need for greater protection of research results, particularly in the field of COVID-19. Canada's world-class research and its open and collaborative research environment are increasingly targeted by espionage and foreign interference, the statement said without naming a particular country conducting the interference. Margaret McQuaig Johnson, a former senior official at the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, said U of A has been a leader among Canadian universities in establishing ties with China. 
All of these professors feel they are doing the right thing by engaging with China and helping China build their capacity. But they have to look very carefully at each deal to see are we being taken to the cleaners and what is the longer term plan for the technology, she told The Globe. U of A signed an agreement with the CCP's Ministry of Science and Technology in 2005 to gain access to at least 50 national laboratories in China. Beijing has given research funding and grants to at least 60 U of A professors who are involved in at least 90 national level research projects in China. Moreover, in 2018, the U of A received a large donation whose size was refused to be disclosed by the university. From Hong Kong tycoon Jonathan Kuhn Sham Choi. Choi is a high-ranking member of Hong Kong's political advisory body to the CCP and has an extremely close tie with Beijing. He is also an enthusiastic supporter of Beijing's political crackdown on Hong Kong. In 2019, University of Alberta signed a Memorandum of Understanding to partner with Hong Kong-based HKAI Labs, a private company researching artificial intelligence. HKAI is funded by Alibaba and SenseTime, a Beijing-based artificial intelligence company that has been blacklisted by the US government for its surveillance role in the crackdown on Uyghurs and minorities in Xinjiang. In Shandong, China, there is a Canadian Centre for Bioinnovation, CCBI, which has an affiliation with the U of A. The organization's website clearly states that it was established to attract Canadian talent for transnational technology transfer. The U of A's Associate Vice President of Innovation and Commercialization, Deborah James, who is among the standing committee of CCBI, is also the honorary president of the Yante YETDA International Incubator for Biomedical Innovation Center, a Chinese state-funded venture and CCBI's parent organization. In addition, three U of A professors and researchers established Trika Technologies, a company selling handheld biosensors in China. In 2018, Trika established a joint venture with Yante YETDA in which the Chinese side holds 60% of all shares, making the Chinese side the decision maker over key issues such as technology and personnel. McKay Johnson said Trika is a classic example of how Canadians should think twice before partnering with China. This is classic where 60% is owned by China and 40% is owned by the Canadian company, she said. Charles Burton, a senior fellow with the McDonnell Laurier Institute, told CTV News that the Alberta taxpayer has a right to know what grants these public institutions may have been received and what conditions may have been attached. On May 28, two more Ontario universities, York and Queen's, were accused of collaborating with another U.S. government's blacklisted Chinese artificial intelligence company, iFlyTech, whose research was used against and to violate the human rights of ethnic minorities in China. China's big tech champion Huawei has recently made big moves on developing countries in Africa, Asia, Europe and the Middle East, signing contracts for the installation of the Chinese Communist Party cloud computing and e-governance solutions. What could Huawei possibly be scheming behind this Trojan horse? The strategic stakes are far higher than Huawei's currently modest global market share would suggest says U.S. Think Tank Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. A May 17 report by CSIS found 70 agreements made between Huawei and 41 countries' governments or state-owned enterprises for the installation of these solutions. The study found 57% of the deals were made with countries described as middle income and 77% who are either partly free or not free according to Freedom House. 36% are African countries and 20% are in Asia. Huawei's cloud infrastructure and e-government services are handling sensitive data on citizens' health, taxes and legal records, says CSIS. These services also operate critical infrastructure from oil production and fuel distribution in Brazil 
to power plant operations in Saudi Arabia. As Huawei carves out a niche as a provider to governments and state-owned enterprises, its activities could provide Chinese authorities with intelligence and even coercive leverage. After the arrest of Huawei's chief financial officer, Meng Wanzhou, as well as a series of crushing tactical blows by the former Trump administration, the regime's vehicle to dominate the world's 5G evolution has desperately pivoted to these countries to plant its dying roots. Huawei, by its own admission, only controls about 4% of the global pie for infrastructure as a service demand, making the developing world with its strong demand fewer barriers to entry and less scrutiny than developed economies, the only fruit hanging low enough for the struggling company to pick. The reality of the perception Huawei salesmen are hawking, however, is far from a comfortable one. The research found 16% of Huawei's cloud and e-governance deals have experienced complications from security, operational or financial issues. Rather than massive gains in efficiency, several customers have been left with projects that wasted public resources and now sit idle. The report uses several examples such as of a $53 million data center in Papua New Guinea that suffered from systematically poor security. An instance where Cabo Verde lost its e-government system for four days to ransomware attack exploit that was several years old and a case where Chinese hackers siphoned data from servers at the African Union headquarters as well as video footage. CSIS study finds the demographic of countries put in ink to paper with the CCP share the same characteristics as the group CSIS sounded the alarm about in a 2019 paper on Huawei's so-called safe cities. However, warnings about Huawei's security risks do not appear to be persuading decision makers in developing countries. Investigators also found that problems with using Huawei's Made in China wares were not only security orientated. For several countries, the purchase and installation of Huawei solutions were effectively a total waste of a developing country's limited money. State data centers in Ghana and Tanzania, for example, have suffered from financial difficulties after failing to attract sufficient users. E-government projects in Guyana and Zambia experienced procurement irregularities and allegations of corruption. Papua New Guinea's state data centre fell into a state of disrepair after planners failed to adequately budget for operations and maintenance. Huawei makes big promises in their sales pitch complete with offers of debt financing from the CCP's banks to install what the report describes as small modular data centres the size of a shipping container to multi-level buildings packed with servers. Usually for the installation of technocratic e-government setups meant to run a country's document digitization, national ID systems, tax services, crisis communications, elections and more. CSIS says Huawei salesmen spend a lot of work promising reduced operational costs to governments, such as a 20% savings allegedly obtained by Brazil's presidential home, the Palanto Palace, although these claims are impossible to verify independently. Huawei also ties hardware and services together, realising developing countries often lack the infrastructure required to run cloud computing services. That need in turn plays to Huawei's historical strengths as a hardware provider. The company is able to tap existing ties with its cloud customers, having provided national fibre optic networks and wireless networks for them, for example, says the report. Finally, Huawei leverages loans most commonly from the Export-Import Bank of China and China Development Bank. The company uses access to lending as a way to close its deals However, in some cases, the data centers are essentially gifts from China. In March 2020, for example, China launched a data center with Huawei equipment in the Serbian city of Krajivac, paid for with a $2 million Chinese grant. 
A few months shy of its completion in November 2019, Serbia signed an agreement with China for Huawei to provide cloud infrastructure and a national AI platform to its national data center, backed by a $13 million grant from Beijing. CSIS says that despite the US government's blacklist of Huawei, which dealt a heavy blow to its access to semiconductors, the regime's golden goose has instead pivoted to take advantage of a demand for cloud computing created by the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, increasing its cloud revenue by 168 per cent in 2020. To counter Huawei's actions and mitigate the potential consequences, CSIS urged the United States and its allies to start to aggressively compete with the Communist Party in the developing world, winning back its piece of the pie. Action is needed because the developing world will play a much larger role in global networks in the coming decade. The United States has advantages in cloud computing that could benefit more developing countries, boosting their competitiveness and supporting the U.S. economy in the process. A more effective sales pitch will require empathy for the trade-offs faced by decision-makers in lower-income markets, where affordability often trumps security concerns, and fashioning incentives to encourage the adoption of alternatives. The United States has strong alternatives on hand, now it must compete, reads the report.